All right, let's open our Bibles this morning to Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. you've read through the Old Testament or have tried to, you probably find it to be a fairly daunting book, and yet there are a couple of things that if you can get a hold of, make the book a whole lot easier to go through. For example, after the book of Judges, which is pretty early in your Bibles, we really come already to the kings. There are three kings that ruled Israel nationally, beginning with Saul in 1040 BC or so, then David, then Solomon, each of them reigned for about 40 years. But when Solomon died in 931 BC, his boy and a bunch of his buddies in trying to rule the country led to a uh, civil war. 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel, only Judah and Benjamin stayed in Jerusalem where God had chosen to put his name, where the temple was. And the other 10 tribes went north. They rebelled against God. They uh, made worship altars of calves. They uh, changed the order of the feast days and the months. They lowered the, the um, qualifications for the priests. And for the next 209 years, the northern kingdom had not one good king. It was wickedness after wickedness, and the Lord had sent prophets to them. And all of the prophets, or nearly all of them in your Bible, can be placed right either before, during, or after those occupations. But finally, the Lord sent the Assyrians in and took over the northern kingdom, never promising to restore any of those tribes back into that northern country. They would have to go back to Jerusalem, where God's name was placed. During that same time in the south, these two uh, tribes that stayed put had eight really good kings. They lasted much longer. They fell to the same problems, the idolatry of the land. In 606, the Lord sent Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians into uh, Jerusalem, and over a period of 20 years or so, they, they and then eventually annihilated the place, took everyone captive. But the Lord, in the judgment that fell upon the south, said, you're going into captivity for 70 years. So you'll learn not to worship idols. And from 606, when the assault started, to 536, the children of Israel were captured and caught and, and held in Babylon by the millions. Two years before then, the Medo-Persian Empire took over the world, and the Babylonians were defeated. And the first king that came to power was a guy named Cyrus. Isaiah mentions him by name as being the king, even <laughs> hundreds of years before he was born, that would allow the Jews to go back home as God had promised. So in 536 BC, King Cyrus said to the Jews, go home. Only 50,000 of them went the 700 miles to the city that was destroyed. I mean, it was a tough life. And Babylonian life was, was advanced and, and easy and and prosperous. The 50,000 went, they quickly started to build the, te the temple because that was the place that the Jews would meet with God. It was the only place they were allowed to, to sacrifice and all. They quickly poured the foundation before they stopped. They said, well, there's too much government pressure. And after all, we're living in tents, we'd like to build our houses first. And, and the, the whole work stopped and for the next 16 years just kind of laid there as the people served themselves. God sent them a couple of prophets, Zechariah, one of them, the book of Haggai you have as well. And with their prompting of saying, you're not going to be blessed putting God second, the people listened to the prophets and began again to build the temple, the place of worship, and it was finished in 516 B.C. Almost 80 years after that first group went back, Ezra led 2,000 others back. Now, the, the temple was up, but the walls weren't built. There was, there was really no security. There was really no roads. It was still living kind of, you know, on the edge. When Ezra showed up, and you can read the book right in front of this one, the book of Ezra, they basically brought priests to lead worship, biblical reforms. It was, it was religious in nature in terms of the relationship of the people with God. Um, but he showed up, and like I said, it was still the frontier. People were marauding over the land. The people were sitting ducks 
It was hardly an example of the glory of God or of his people. Twelve years later, we get to this book, 446 or so B.C., and we meet near Nehemiah, a, a young man that was born in captivity, 700 miles away from a city he had never seen, who served the king in a very trusted position. He tasted his food. And if anyone was trying to poison the king, it was Nehemiah, hopefully that would keel over first. So you had to trust this guy to say, yeah, I tasted that. <laughs> Everything's fine. He was working for a king that history tells us was not a nice guy. And like all sovereign kings over the world, you know, kind of just lived by his sinful flesh. But in that position, Nehemiah began to be concerned with the city of Jerusalem and its, its presentation, its safety, its people. He asked his brother who had gone there how it was. He got the bad news. And God began to prepare Nehemiah for a work that he had prepared for him. Last week in chapter 1, we talked about, in those 10 verses, how does God call you? And how do you know where the Lord has called you to? And we, we gave you four things to think about. Number one, that God's work always begins in the heart of an individual, not in the heart of a group. It, it is an individual calling, as Nehemiah's was. Second of all, you can oftentimes determine what God has called you to by what breaks your heart, really doesn't break the hearts of others. Something you're concerned about, what, what moves you. And Nehemiah was concerned for a place he'd never seen, while the rest of the, the nation just loved living in the Babylon area and all of the benefits that it brought. In his despair, Nehemiah began to pray. And our third point was, you know, despair should get you to, on your knees and say, God, what are you going to do about this? How are you going to work this out? How, how can this impossible situation become possible? He confessed his part in the sin that brought judgment to begin with, that of his fathers and the nation. And then finally he said to the Lord, I just want you to be used. I'm willing to be the answer to my prayers. Use me, fill me, send me. And we left Nehemiah there with those four things in mind. His heart broken, the circumstances, if not difficult, more so. He, he, he prayed, he was concerned, he made himself available. And then he went back to work, tasting food or whatever that involved which is where we join him this morning in the first 10 verses of chapter 2. I'm not going to be able to do this introduction every week, by the way. We'll never get to, when we get to chapter 6. <laughs> and it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and I gave it to the king. Now, I had never been sad in his presence before. I'm sure that all of us have people in our lives that are authorities, that influence us or control us to some extent, whether it is a parent or a teacher or an employer, whatever it might be, submission to authority is one of those things that God wants we as Christians to learn, knowing that he's ultimately in charge. It is also one of the hardest things for us to learn because we have a, you know, sin will not allow us to do that. Pride gets in the way. And it is made more challenging when the authority over you, like Nehemiah here, is an unbeliever who has absolute power, who makes selfish choices, and seems to be standing between you and what you believe God wants for you. And so here's this impediment, if you will, and Nehemiah finds himself in that, in that position. When you are in that position, you believe God has called you somewhere, but someone is, is interrupting, I, I think you're moved towards God. Then you have to believe, like Nehemiah did, that God answers prayer. And that praying can make a difference because that's pretty much all you have left. You really can't make a noise. You can't yell and scream. You'll, you'll get the, you know, the, the, the rough end of the stick on that deal. When Hudson Taylor, who founded Inland China Missions, you know, wrote his book about how difficult establishing ministry in China was, one of the sentences he wrote, which I'll, I kind of remembered I've written down, he wrote this, I am convinced and have learned that it is possible to move men through prayer alone without any worldly tactics of anger or intimidation. In other words, like Nehemiah, you're, you're kind of in a position where God's worked in your heart, but you don't know how to get to where you believe he wants you to go because someone stands in the way. And for Nehemiah, it was a man who had absolute authority, and yet he served a God who was greater than, obviously, the king. And so he begins to pray. 
and he weeps and he fasts and he prays some more and he goes back to work and nothing happens. In fact, if you compare chapter 1, verse 1 with chapter 2, verse 1, you learn that it didn't happen at all for quite a while. He began to pray in November, December, in the month of Chislev. He is now in the month of April, May in Nisan. It has been over four months since he had begun to pray. He had been praying specifically. He was lined up with God's will. He had accompanied his prayers with fasting. He was serious about what he was praying for. And yet there was an, an inkling after four months of any kind of progress. A third of a year goes by. And he sees nothing, no, no assurance that God is listening or that heaven's doors are open or that God could care. There is a four-month time gap between these two chapters because there's nothing new to report. Nothing has moved forward on that front at all. He still continues to pray night and day. He, he still, his heart is still on fire to do this work. You know, he, his eyes are still filled with tears, but the doors of heaven seem closed and God seems silent, and there's no deadline, and there's no ultimatum. He just prays. <laughs> he just prays. If you use the Bible as the template for life, as we certainly should, you will come to the conclusion that most prayers that are prayed by God's people have a time of waiting in between the prayer and the answer. Now, that's not always true. There's a great verse in, in chapter 65 of the book of uh, Isaiah, verse 25, 24, I think, that says, it'll come to pass before you call that I will answer. And while you are speaking, I will hear. I love that verse. I wish that was true in all of my prayers. I could probably get the world fixed in an hour. <laughs> but God doesn't do that. Not normally. Normally there is a waiting that takes place. And, and it is in the waiting that we can learn a lot about ourselves and, and we learn a lot about this man that God would use. Because usually when we wait and when we are, what we're praying for is important to us and it's churning within and we're very impatient, we will do a couple of weird things. People begin to make deals with God. If you'll do this for me, here's what I'm gonna do for you. As if the Lord's going, ah, I'm holding out for a bit. No deal, you know, more money. Or we fall into the trap of, well, the, the devil convinces us that God will never answer our prayers because he doesn't really like us. He likes everyone else, doesn't like us. Why does God have you wait? There, there's plenty of reasons, I think, in the scriptures, not the least of which is time tends to winnow the field. Or if you will, to make sure that your calling is a calling from God and not some emotional response to a present situation. Delays in, in prayer help you to come back to God. What would you do, do you think, if every time you prayed, God just answered? I suspect you'd show up less. And when you showed up, you'd stay a shorter amount of time. Hey, I got the list, I gotta go. But here's the list, just get that done by noon, thank you. But, but delays in prayer brings you back, doesn't it? It, it causes you to, to commit yourself to, to continuing to pray. Hannah was a woman who was married to a man who had two wives. The other wife had children like a rabbit. He looked at her and she got pregnant. And then there was Hannah, who loved the Lord, who'd go every year to the feast days, couldn't have a child, and, and prayed every year, God, I just want a child. And God didn't answer. But then something began to happen in Hannah's heart. He, she began to pray differently. She, she began to say, Lord, if you give me a son, I'll, I'll give him back to you to serve you. I'll dedicate his life to you so that you might use him. And I think that's all the Lord wanted to hear because that next year, she had Samuel, the last judge, the, the prophet to the, the, the nation, the one that would usher in the times of the kings. And he was brought to serve the Lord as a young age. Mom was all on board to, to dedicate this boy to the service of God. There's a parable that Jesus tells in, in well, it's actually in a couple of places, but there's one in Luke 18 that begins with the words, and he taught them a parable that men ought always to pray and not to faint. And then Jesus tells a story of an unjust judge in a town. Wicked guy, served himself, had way too much power, didn't care about the people, and there was a poor widow who, who really needed to get justice from the, from the government, and yet he wouldn't so much as hear from her, wouldn't listen to her. She really had no one to go to bat for her. She was 
She was <laughs> broke. She had no representation. And yet her only hope was to go back every day and just knock on his door. Hi, I'm back again. It's Tuesday. I'll be back on Wednesday. And she just became like this dripping faucet, you know, this, this squeaky whip. And the Lord said that this wicked judge said, no, I don't care what anybody thinks, and I certainly am not moved by the opinions of man, but this woman's wearing me out. So I'm going to answer her prayers just because she drives me nuts. And then Jesus said, how much more do you think your Father in heaven will answer the prayers of those who call to him? He compares himself to this man who could be cajoled into answering because he just didn't want to be bothered and he sets himself in opposition to that. Look, I, I'm a God who wants to answer prayer. If there's a delay, it's because God has a plan and he's not trying to keep you from what is best. He's trying to bring you to a place that is best. At least from Nehemiah, one of the things we learn about waiting upon the Lord to open doors for us is that while you are waiting, you should be planning or planning ahead. If you ask yourself the question, when the Lord answers this prayer, what will I do next? And you begin to think through what the next steps might be, you might very well discover that God has been waiting so that he could give to you the direction you're gonna to need to move forward, to count the cost, to think the work through, to carefully focus on what lies ahead, not to just show up going, all right, now what, I don't know. He prepares you for the place he's got prepared for you. <clears throat> I believe that God will never stir your heart unless he has and, and will provide a way for you to meet and accomplish the work. But it's kind of like you got to do your part while you wait upon him to do his. So here's Nehemiah. <clears throat> Spends four months on his knees. He works faithfully at his job. He has no... Um, indication that God has been listening. He, he leaves his concerns for Jerusalem with the Lord and, and he goes to work. It was between him and the Lord. Notice we read in verse one, I had never been sad in the king's presence before. When he went to work, he didn't wear his concerns on his sleeve. He wasn't one to complain. This is between him and the Lord. But this day the king took notice of his face. It showed and it frightened Nehemiah. This is a king that could take your life. And so we read in verse two that the king said to me, what is wrong with your face? <laughs> Why is your face sad? You're not sick. This is nothing but a sorrow of heart and I became dreadfully afraid. And I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad? When the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste, and the gates have been burned with fire. <clears throat> One day, without really planning it, Nehemiah couldn't hide the sorrow of his heart. The king, pretty observant guy, noticed it immediately. The question produced an instant dread in Nehemiah's heart. There's a proverb in chapter 16 that says, a messenger of death is the wrath of his king. A wise man will seek to appease it. And this was a powerful guy. So Nehemiah is terrified. Oh no, this is not good for me. Not the way I'm supposed to be doing my job. But <clears throat> being called out and it being too late to go back, in verse three he tells the king, exactly what is bothering him. He tells him truthfully. He tells him quickly. Uh, he knows, and if you've read the Bible, you know that Jerusalem was viewed by, by dynasties as a rebellious, troublesome bunch of people. So to ask to rebuild a place that had been a problem for previous administrations is, is kind of a hard ask, I guess. But Nehemiah lays it out. Why shouldn't I be sad? And he speaks from his heart and he shares his concerns. This is what's breaking my heart. What would the king say? Am I dead now or what? And the king says, verse 4, what do you want me to do about it? And so I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you would send me to Judah. 
to the city of my father's tombs that I might rebuild it. <clears throat> Nehemiah, realizing that he was still standing, quickly threw up a prayer. People someday say, how should you pray? I, I think you should just pray. Apparently this was a quickie, right? I don't think he got on his knees, closed his eyes, and raised his hands. Excuse me, I'll be right back. No, under his breath, Lord, help me now. This is, this is it, you know, this is four months of praying, four months of fasting, and one more prayer goes up before the Lord. And I want you to notice something as Nehemiah asks in, ver in verse uh, five very clearly what he wants, that Nehemiah does not try to help God out. Now I point that out to you because true faith in God means you let God handle things, right? I think if this had been me, I'm just trying to put myself in his shoes, I might have come up with 500 reasons while this would be really advantageous for the king. Look, dude, if we build this place, you'll have a, a city that backs you out on the frontier. You'll have, you'll have a reach that is far greater than you have now. I'll be there for you. We'll, we'll inhabit it. We'll put some soldiers out. You, you could sell this thing maybe to a king that is concerned about running the world, but he doesn't do any of that. He just goes, all right, here's, what, here's my heart, here's my problem, here's what I'd like to do. And that's it, not, not couched in any kind of arguments or logic or reasoning or argument. He just simply said, this is what I want. And, and I, I wrote in my Bible years ago, Nehemiah, when the king answers, was prepared. Not prepared, prepared. He was ready to answer. He didn't need to kick in any doors. The Lord was going to open these doors, and Nehemiah counted on it. Well, the king responded in verse six while the queen was sitting next to him. And don't you love the parentheses? Because the only reason it's there, I think, is to tell us that the queen had a lot of influence. And most queens do. <laughs> Wives do. Moms do. How long will your journey be and when will you return? And so it pleased the king to send me and I said him a time. The king asks two questions that really only need one answer. How long will you be gone when you come back? Kind of the same question. Amer apparently, Nehemiah was a good worker. He was liked by the king. The king wanted him back. Thank the Lord, he had been a good servant all of these years. And the, the king, with the king, queen sitting beside him, decided that he would send Nehemiah. It pleased the king to send me. It made him happy to send me. That's a good relationship. And I set him a time. Now, I have no idea what Nehemiah told him this day about how long he'd be gone. I can tell you that in chapter 5, verse 14, it says he was gone 12 years. I doubt if that was the initial answer because the king eventually just says to him, I want you to be the governor there. I want you to, to be a political guy. But, but needless to say, whatever he said, he had an answer. Now, here's the lesson. Remember, prepared. Planning while you wait. He was able to give an answer. It is, it is so different from those who say, I'll say, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm just not making any plan. I'm just letting the Lord lead. Well, that's just an excuse for being lazy, right? Or not making any, I'll just let the Lord lead. Well, you should let the Lord lead, but you should plan. Do your part. Walking by faith does not mean absent of organization or, or planning or forethought. In fact, just the opposite is true. Look what he's been doing for four months. And the king, when he asks him, was able to say, how long are you going to be gone? Here's how long I'm going to be gone. What are you going to need in the next couple of verses? Here's what I'm going to need. He had answers. He had them prepared. And God used this time of waiting to prepare Nehemiah and to prepare the way. Don't despise the days of small things, Jarrah. I know Ezekiel would write in chapter 4. And it is important that, you know, a man's heart will plan his ways, but the Lord will direct his steps. The cost of not planning is a bill that no one can afford. Because planning is, is the hardest part of any ministry. I spend hours every week studying. And I'm be honest with you, there are days I'd rather not do it. My head hurts. It's only 8.30. <laughs> Sometimes you struggle with verses and you have other things to distract you and but if I just showed up without planning, I think you would hate it. I'd go, well, let's see what the Lord will say to us now. I don't know. It would be horrible. Not that my planning has helped that much, but it's better than nothing at all. 
But the teaching is always a lot of fun. Unless people fall asleep on you, it's a lot of fun. You look forward to Sunday mornings. Oh, let's go through the Bible. Let, let's go look at what God could teach us. But the planning is not always so much fun. And yet it, it's the hardest part, but without it, everything else doesn't work. And it's that way when we seek God for open doors that he hasn't yet set before us. Jesus said there in, in Luke, what is it, 14, which of you would try to build a tower without further sitting down and counting to see whether you have enough money to finish it, lest laying the foundation, you run out of cash and people begin to mock you and say, man, that guy wasn't well prepared. Or which king of you would go out to fight with 10,000 men against 20,000 unless you know you could win? And if you knew that you couldn't, wouldn't you send and try to make peace before the battle started so you don't lose your men? There's something important about planning. So here's what Nehemiah says in verse 7. Notice the word, furthermore. I said to the king, well, if it pleases the king to send me, <laughs> here's what I'm going to need. I'm going to need letters from you given to me to the governors beyond the river that they would permit me to pass through until I come to, Jerusalem, uh, to Judea, to Jerusalem there. And I need a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest. I'm going to need timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel, which pertains to the temple, for the city walls, for my house that I'm going to have to occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. I love how planning pays off here. Here's some practical things I'll need, King, now that you're happy to send me. I'm going to need safe travel. I'm going to need a visa. I've got to go through Moab. I've got to go through Ammon. I've got to through a lot of people that are going to want to kill me. But if you'll just give me the, the, the authorization from the king to travel those 700 miles to Jerusalem, that would be very helpful. I'd be traveling under your authority. And I'm going to need a load of equipment and a bunch of materials. I'm going to need your Home Depot card. I'm going to need a truck. <laughs> I'm going to need stuff for the walls and the gates and the temple and my house that I'm going to live in. I'm going to need tools and equipment. Isn't it a good thing that he was planning? I, I suspect that if the king says, what are you going to need? He goes, dude, I don't know. How long are you going to be gone? Who knows? I don't think he'd have gone anywhere. All of that praying would have been for naught because he hadn't done his part. And there is a part that you do. Even in prayer, there's a part for you and there's a part for him. I think maybe one of my greatest frustrations is when you work with people that don't plan or you get involved with things that, that haven't been planned very well, right? People don't sit down and think about what they're doing. They don't anticipate what might be a problem so they can never allevi alleviate them. They just react when problems arise. They, 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 they don't work them out or beforehand or they make an excuse and say, well, I, I've never done this. I don't know what to plan for. Well, I would just say to you, Nehemiah's never done this. Here's what he does. Give me that cheesecake. I'll eat that for you. That was his preparation for building a wall. Let me have some of that wine. There you go. Ah, oh, it looks good to me. It's a good year. Here you go, king. That was all he'd done to prepare, to build a wall, to run a, to run a, a project, to, to build a city, to, to lead God's people. But he planned. We need to think ahead. Don't excuse not planning. Verse 8 at the end, and the king gave me, <laughs> granted me everything that I asked. And, and, and Nehemiah is not foolish enough or naive enough to think that the king was on his side. He realized it was God's good hand upon him that had given him this favorable king. Praise the Lord. It's all in God's hands. <laughs> the king is the king of the world, and then I serve the king who's the king over the king of the world. Now, historically here, Nehemiah was given by a world power, the Medo-Persians, the authority to go and rebuild Jerusalem. Now, I'm mentioning to you this in passing. But in Daniel chapter 9, there is a wonderful prophecy in the last four verses of the chapter where God lays out for Daniel his dealings with national Israel from the day that this took place until the second coming of Christ. And he does it in days and months and years. The 70th week of Daniel. You might remember reading that. The 70 weeks of Daniel. Suffice it to say that the linchpin for that prophecy in Daniel 9 begins with this order to go build and rebuild Jerusalem. Now, Nehemiah wasn't aware of the fact that God was, while he was doing everything else, 
was having to steer this to a day so that when Daniel got this prophecy, it would work out to the day that the Lord would show up on April uh, 6th, 32 AD. You can go back and do the math. But suffice it to say, Nehemiah had to wait in part for God to bring the date around that would fulfill a prophecy that the, the prophet Daniel had spoken. In other words, God sometimes in having you wait is doing other things that you may not be aware of, but he works all things together for good. So it may not be your deal, but he's working other things out and you're kind of on his team, aren't you? So uh, needless to say, this, this you know, would, would take place. And like I said, Daniel 9 is an interesting story. So Daniel, he didn't get it, but he would get it. Jesus, you remember, wept over the city of Jerusalem, if you had known in this your day the things that belong to your peace. Or the, the singing of the Hallel Psalms that year, this is the day that the Lord has made. And Daniel points out the, the, the day that the Lord would come to Jerusalem to, to sacrifice himself, to be cut off but not for himself, as the prophecy reads. So there was more to it than just Nehemiah's, but, but from Nehemiah we learn planning and waiting is something that God wants. Verse nine says, so I went to the governors in the region beyond the river. I gave them, them the king's letters. And the king sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. Well, here's something he hadn't asked for. It's kind of that Ephesians 3.20, the Lord does abundantly, exceedingly abundantly. He has the best army in the world at his back now. The, the army that controls everything is now running opposition for him or, or, or protection for him. And God did even more than he could ask. Well, we end with this verse in verse 10. We'll then send Balat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite heard, their officials, they heard of it, and it disturbed them that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. Here's one thing that you can learn when God begins to work in your life. When God begins to use you, the enemy is upset. Now, there's only two folks listed here. And by the way, you're going to come to hate these people. Because they're going to grow into an army and they're going to get wicked and threaten lives and try to pick people off. But so far, there's only two of them. They've never met Nehemiah. They've only heard of his intention. He intends to bless, to serve, to help God's people. And they're already deeply disturbed. Whenever you step out, understand that the enemy is going to step out as well. If you want to avoid the battle, do nothing. But can you live there, just sitting on the shelf? Is that where God has put you? Of course not. So this number will grow, and the intensity of their hatred will grow, and the opposition will grow. We'll even have a verse later on that says they began to make fun of the wall. But by the time they're making fun of the wall, they're standing on the other side of it. So laugh all you like, pal. But we can barely hear you because of the wall. We will probably stop sometime in chapter three or four and just look at all of the verses that talk about opposition to what God wants to do in your life because it's, it's, it's a lesson worth learning. So look, I don't know what God's called you to do and maybe you've been praying and God hasn't answered but I wouldn't be discouraged. He's a God who loves to answer prayer. He has a plan for you that is far better than your own. His timing, I know it looks terrible to you but it is always by the book, it is absolutely on time. God doesn't miss it by a moment. So even if you're in an impossible situation where the heart that you have to serve the Lord seems to be interrupted by people and circumstance, God can open doors that only he can open. So here's what you do, keep praying, don't give up. And if God is really burning that within your heart, make plans, man, start making notes and lists. And what, Lord, if the Lord opens the door, this is the way I'm gonna go. This is what I'm gonna do. Here's where I'm gonna follow. And the Lord will bless that. You don't need to prime the pump. You don't need to give a fancy speech. You don't have to play for attention or somehow try to work the system. Just let God open doors. He's good at it. Seek God, wait and pray. Don't be discouraged. Use your time wisely and wait for the Lord to open the doors. And in that process, pretty excited to be a Christian then, isn't it? Pretty exciting to watch God open doors. You never know when it'll be. When you least expect it, the Lord will move. And then you'll be ready to go through because you've planned ahead and thought it through. Next week, we'll take up the next uh, 10 verses to the end of chapter two. Read ahead. And the subject of next week is, well, Nehemiah has a vision. Now, how do you get that vision to others? It's a good lesson indeed. Father, we thank you this morning as we sit together for this good book of 
of service and leadership and learning to hear your voice and, and how to wait upon you and all the lessons that come with it. I pray that you teach us that there's great value in praying when answers aren't coming and to continue in prayer when we don't s- seem to think like you're listening at all. W- weeks turn into months and, and still nothing and we wonder, God, where you've gone. But may we learn from Nehemiah and others that it's important that there's that time of waiting to secure our hearts, to, to, to teach us about depending upon you, to plan. So when that day comes, we'll be ready to count the cost. And that your prayers, and that our prayers, I should say, are not like that unjust judge in a town who only responds because we're nagging. But you set yourself in opposition to him. You, you respond because you love us. And you're for us. And you don't hold anything back from us that is good for us. So may you help us to learn to pray more and to find great comfort knowing that we are heard on high by the God who made the earth. Shall we stand?